So I ask anybody who would like for me to come into their classroom and to help them change an area of their classroom that they were really not happy with. And I got, <laughs> as you might well imagine, stacks of volunteers. Um, and so I would then go to their classroom and look at their classroom with them and talk to them about it and ask them specifically what area they thought they would like to work on because I really wanted them to, to be connected to this. I didn't want to go in and just do it because if you do that, what's going to happen is when you leave, it goes back to the way it was before, right? <laughs> because they really aren't sure about how it works. I mean, so uh, it had to be something that they really wanted to do. And over all those groups, which is probably about two or three hundred volunteers that I had, uh, I had to pick out ones that I could help and would work with because I needed at least 20 to do over the time frame that I had. And so um, with them, we figured out what that was and which areas we were going to work on. And then um, I went in over a, a year period for each classroom and helped them. We talked to the children and asked them what they liked about their classroom, what they'd like to change. We talked to the teachers. We took the four pictures. Uh, then we went in. I took a team of students in with me, and we tried to make some of the changes. And then we went back. Um, six months or nine months later and talked to the children again and also talked to the teacher because we wanted to see how they felt about what had happened. So what I'm going to be talking to you about for this next period of time is about how those changes came to be and what those changes uh, were and how they can impact what you're doing in your classroom. Because I think for a long time, we don't really think about, as teachers, how the environment impacts the children and us. It impacts us too. I want you to be able to go into a space where you feel good, where you feel happy about being there, as well as the children feeling that way. Uh, and so we have to think about this. And a lot of this work came, was inspired, really, uh, by the Reggio Emilia program, which is in Italy. How many of you have heard of Reggio Emilia? Okay, it's a program in Italy where it's supposed to be the most wonderful early childhood programs in the world. And I was lucky enough to be on an early team that went there about 15 years ago. Uh, and it was just a few people were visiting. And then I went back about three years ago and, and visited again. So I've been able to go there twice, which was a really interesting experience for me. Uh, to be able to be a part of that. So part of what I'm going to be telling you and talking to you about is great, greatly influenced by that. When I went to Reggio for the first time, I'd already been teaching at the academic uh, level for about 15 years. So I was already an early childhood professor uh, and had a lot of experience. So, you know, I thought I knew everything, right? <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> um, but what I found is that I had to rethink what I knew about environments totally. And it was really a uh, life-changing experience for me. The, I was there for a solid week, morning, night, morning, afternoon, and night, immersed in this Reggio approach with people speaking off and on English and, and Italian. <laughs> Um, and visiting in the programs and visiting with the parents. So it was really an immersion. Uh, and it really changed my way of thinking totally. So I'm going to try to share some of that with you. But I also want you to ask me questions because for me it's been a five-year process. So I wouldn't expect you in one hour to feel like you uh, had a whole new view of environments. But I hope it will at least start making you think about how your environment looks. Because most of the time, we don't think about that. We just go in, and, and early childhood people, and I include myself here, are collectors of things. How many of you are collectors? I didn't say hoarder, you notice. Collector. <laughs> I was very careful about using the right word there. So, uh, so I want you to know it's collector. And, and my husband has learned from my comments over the years, and he said to me one day, uh, how many more things are you going to collect? <laughs> so very tactful. <coughs> so 
I'm just going to leave this to their great minds and hopefully they will figure this out. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about the process um, that I went through and that some of the things that I learned. One of the things that I learned is that teachers know an area of their classroom that's not working. They know it. They just don't know what to do about it. And so together we had to kind of figure that out because there was no place, <clears throat> excuse me, no place where you could go but it says, if your room is like this, this is what you do. There wasn't anything like that. So um, what I had to do is to try to figure out how to make that work. So teachers do know where it's not working. I think you probably do. And one of the things I want you to do today is I want you to write down an area of your classroom. If I said, okay, I'm going to come to your classroom tonight in the middle of the night and I'm going to be your environmental fairy. <laughs> and tomorrow we're going to go and you're going to have a, a new area. What area of your classroom would you want to work on? And I want you to write it down because I've got a theory of this. All right, write it down on your paper. Which area do you want to reduce? If you have a please write down stuff. Which area do you want to reduce?
see what they meant. Because if they took a off-white wall, and I say off-white, but it always has a kind of a pink tone, but it's a warm off-white. The children's work looked like it was in a museum. And what you saw was not the designs of the colors, but the children's work. And it was a total different way of thinking. Because I came up through the time when every classroom had a different color. And we even had purple colors around the top of one room and the red around another room. And a, I mean, you know. And so I still have to say that I love my colors and I still like to have it, but I have begun to understand the perception that what is it you want people to look at? Is it the color of the wall? No, it's the children's work, right? And so we'll think about that as we're talking about this, but remember that this, from Rancho, is a country that cherishes aesthetics and has so many beautiful, wonderful things around that it certainly touches that. Why are the environment, why is the environment important? Car walks into the classroom. They look at that classroom that's never been there before. They look at it and they think, what's gonna happen to me here? <laughs> and if the chairs are all buckled to the floors, but I'm just being extreme. A little child looks at that and thinks, oh my gosh, <laughs> they're going to want me to sit quietly. How horrible. Or they see in the classroom lots of interesting things that are appropriate for young children and they think, woohoo. I think this is a good place. And so we want to think about how it communicates to the child. I heard a child say this is out of their mouths. I love children, they say a lot of them. Right? <laughs> he said, he looked around the room and he said, there's nothing to do. <laughs> And so you know, because you now know and know how smart little kids are, you know that there's nothing to do. What do they do? They create things to do. Woohoo! <laughs> and it may not be exactly what you had planned for the day. I remember walking into the restaurant, and a little boy was very intrigued about this. I mean, it was a science lesson. Where's our science lesson? What did I tell you? It was a science lesson. He had, you know, that terrible brown paper that we had in bathrooms? You know what I'm talking about? It doesn't absorb anything. It's just blazing it. Well, he just, he had set up this experiment. And the experiment was to see how much paper you could stuff up the faucet. <laughs> and then turn both handles on at the same time and see how far it would go. <laughs> You'll have to admit it was a creative experience, right? <laughs> and before I saw him in the bathroom, he'd already been running it for a while. So we had paper, that yucky brown paper, soft, stuck over the walls in about six different places before I got there. And so he was running an experiment. So if they don't have something interesting to do, I can guarantee you they will find something interesting to do. So remember that. It's a lot of work. Yeah. But I like to think of it as preventative. Because it is. If I have an interesting layout, interesting things to do, then I am going to be less likely to be involved in things that it influences their learning. 
If there's never any small blocks out, guess what? I'm not going to be able to develop that small motor So what they learn in your classroom will be impacted by the materials you select to put there. I read a story of study on child care facilities and said the average number of books in a typical child care facility for three, fours, and fives was five books per classroom. Now that's scary, isn't it? Because how can you develop literacy if you have five books? So by what you choose to put into that classroom, as well as your design, will be it impacts behavior. If I put one red truck in the block area, I can guarantee I'm going to have a Bible. I mean, I can guarantee. Well, they shouldn't learn to share. <laughs> These are three more than five year olds. I know some 30 and 40 year olds who don't know how to share. But it just takes a while, folks. It doesn't happen overnight. Give them a few toys. Give them some choices. Now this is kind of an interesting one. If everything in my classroom is set up that is beyond my capabilities, what does it teach me? Something's on the list. Hey teacher really knows her stuff. She really knows what to do. And I can't do anything, so what's wrong with me? And the opposite is true. If there are things where that child can go home every day and feel like, hey, I did that. And their confidence drops. They become more confident in that thing. And we talked about responsibility. So I'll sit here and say it, but I'm going to say it in responsibility. Now, this is a new one, and my next book is going to be about this because it's really interesting. How do we develop a sense of community? Now, we talk a lot about community as far as the community parents and the community they live in and all that. I'm talking about a different kind. I'm talking about a different kind. I'm talking about a community within the classroom where everybody is accepted, everybody is respected, and everybody is, feels good about being there, no matter what. So we want them to feel a sense of community. Now, what are the elements of design? Now, this is from a design standpoint, not from an early childhood. This is a design issue. So what do we have to think about? This is all in your hand. Okay, the aesthetic environment is beauty. You know, every child should live, and I believe every teacher should live in a space of beauty. And so we have to think about how does how can we make this space beautiful? We'll talk about some of the lessons. We also have to be interested in visual environment. How does it look? Now, knowing that we are all collectors, <laughs> one of the biggest things that I saw in visiting all these hundreds of centers and classrooms was, are you ready for this? I know this is going to be earth shaking. Too much stuff. Too much stuff. Now what happens to us as teachers, and I know it happens to me too, so I can say it happens to me too, is that we add things, <coughs> and then we add some more things, and then the next year we add some more things, and then we add some more things, and pretty soon it's filled with things. Now, for some children, that would be fine. But if you have a child who is sensory, has sensory issues, and visual is one of them, they suffer from visual overload. And so they walk into a space like that and they're, okay. So visual, how does it 
look, now listen, ladies and gentlemen. You can't see it. You can't see it. Because you look at it every day. You are habituated to it. You are habituated to it. You see it every day. So you don't notice anything anymore. You don't notice it. So what you must do is you must take a picture of that spell. Because when you take a picture, it lets you see what it looks like. And what you can see. That's not my passion. I've got the wrong one. <laughs> no, I think this is your class.
giving a child a, a, um, a gallon jug of water and say water the plants, right? <laughs> you're going to adapt the environment to them. You must remember that they're going to they're going to pour however much water is in that bucket. <laughs> and so instead, one of the things that we do is if it needs a cup of water, we put on the side of the plant a, a cup of water, you know, the cut out shape. Of and then the child knows this is how much that plant needs. So there's lots of ways of making the environment so good understand. I want to do that. Uh, go back. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 One of the things that you want to think about in your display is making your displays beautiful. Instead of just you know, putting things up there, think about how can I display it so it looks beautiful. You remember the first time you ever did uh, a needlework or a, a embroidery or some sort of, I never did very much of that, but when I did, <laughs> <laughs> let's say artwork, when you framed it, oh my gosh, it looks so good, just simply by the way it was framed. So think about the way you display things. Make them attractive when you display them. Make them think about that. <coughs> uh, this is inside the home living that I showed you earlier that we had built. But this, these are pictures of the children. And this particular time of the, um, in this room, we had all the pictures of children who had parents in the military. And so we had all of those displayed right there with the child in that area. And then we had a little book that had all their pictures with their parents in it. And so those became very popular items for the children to look at. And this is my dad. This is my mom. You know, it was very special. So think about how you display things like that. Um, this is a bit, if you're in an in a old school or in a sharing a place, there's all these overhead projectors everywhere. Nobody uses them anymore. They are great in the early childhood classrooms. Here what we're doing is we're using colored blocks on it. Then the colored blocks go up on the wall. And so it's a whole different way of looking at your wall structures. So think about some possibilities like that. Here what we're talking about is look how the books are stacked. Which book do I want? I want the one with the ducks. You see why? They can see it. Yeah, they can see the pictures. They can figure out what the book has got. The other ones there don't move off at all. Nobody can see what they are. Also, on the top, one of the things that we're beginning to study more is lighting. These are little lines up here at the top. My husband is a, a not concentrist. The first time he went into an early childhood classroom, he said, Oh my gosh, there's too much lights here. I said, what do you mean? He said, you, you base the number of lights and wattage you have based on the task you do. And he said, this room is lit for like mechanical drawers. So we really overkill light. And we also know that fluorescent lighting is probably the worst. <laughs> because children who are sensitive to lighting and the changes in that are particularly bothered by fluorescent lights because it flickers. And so it really bothers some children. A simple thing that we can't seem to get people to do is just to put a dimmer on a light. Because if you can adjust it based on what you're going to be doing, it's much better. Sound of sorting. I don't have to do it fast. I told you. This is an easy solution to helping absorb sound. A lot of absorb sound. Drugs, soft furniture, pillows. These things absorb sound. And you put the sound absorbing materials where there is where the sound is produced. You don't put it somewhere else in the classroom. Say, so, oh well, I want the, the library area to be quiet, so I'll put all the sound absorbed up. You put the sound absorption where it is produced. What is the noisiest place in the classroom? So that's where you want to start first. Can you put a little area rug down in the block here? Another thing that you can do that's very easy to make, this is insulation, like they put in houses that 
they're about this thick for insulation between the walls. You cover that with loose fabric. I like burlap, but it can be anything. It has loose and woven. And you put it where the sound is produced. And this is it's in the music center. And so it helps absorb the sound there. It costs literally very little. Now, if you want to buy it professionally, I can find you a good story for $750 a pound. But you can also make it and do it with, with very minimal cost. So those can become dividers. Now, the other thing that somebody asked me, and I'll tell you because I thought it was a great idea, can you put pictures and things on that? Yes. It will still absorb it. So you can hang children's pictures. You can hang, you know, whatever you, yeah, whatever you want to hang on that. As long as you lose, leave some space in between, so it will absorb it. This is a music area. So you don't have to go to the teacher and say, would you give me this? Where is this? It's right there for you. Now part of that is also responsibility. Where do I put it back? See, if you, if you have that place consistently used, what they learn is you put it back where it belongs. And one of the little mottos we always say with the kids, if you take it out, get it. So that's how you uh, do that. Uh, this is the home living. Remember me showing you the home living? Now it's a fire station. So it's become a fire station. Here's the hose, here's the boots, here's the other things that belong in the fire station. All right there for them to use. This is an example of a nursery environment. So you have a place where you can sit and rock. You also have a soft life. This was in a classroom where the teacher wanted to have a new library set. She had these big bookcases. And she, I mean, they were just filled with junk. And so we took the doors off put soft materials inside of it and put the books and materials they would use right around it and this became her library. Um, if you have children who are from different cultures in your classroom, include those in your environment. This was a little girl that was from India and when they went to India during Christmas, she came back and her mother brought some fabric. So we added it to one of the areas. So if you have children who are from different cultures, share their beautiful things because that helps them feel more a part of the community because they have that here. Challenging materials. Some things should be slightly beyond them. So it stretches. Now this is the, the house we built. Uh, home living here, then it became later the fire station, and now it's the doctor's office. So it's basically the same structure. What happened different is that the materials inside of it are different. And so therefore, the kind of play that they do is very different. <laughs>
definitely <laughs> need plugs in the music area. I definitely need a plug where I have the big groups. Windows have a great impact because of lighting too much, too little, all of those things. And where are the doors? I had a teacher in one of the classrooms, I was right there, and she said, I have lots of children who come in late. And she said, when they come through, when they come in late, they walk through everybody and they hit on everybody they walk by. Hi. But what it does is it draws 
place where every child in your classroom has a picture. Because every classroom I ever visited in Reggio, the first thing that you walked in that room was you saw the pictures of the children. And it said to those children, and children would say this to me. And see, this place belongs to that is the core. Oh boy, you all are good. Yes, that's the core. That's it. You can, well, I can't ever guarantee. I used to say I would guarantee, but I, it's really hard to do. I left it in my office and attended for over a without any water or anything. And when I came back, it looked just like it did when I left. So it's pretty hard. Now, I also want you to look here because I want you to see the rocking chair. The teacher said, and she had this in her classroom before, she said, I really love this rocking chair. Okay, you need to keep it. Because that was her. She treasured it. She said, I got it when I was in England and I carried it with me everywhere I've ever been. And I said, you need to be in your classroom. And so she brought it out. And so it was a gift from her relatives or something. So it means that your room not only has things for kids, the room also has things for you. How you have your pictures display doesn't really make any difference. But we have such wonderful cameras these days. It's so easy to get a picture of that child and have a group of them to see. Because it shows you who has ownership of this space. These are responsibility charts where you, each child has responsibilities and different ways of doing things. Okay, are you ready? This is going to be the big, big disorientation. Are you ready? You have your glasses of water ready.
teacher said, this is her classroom now. She said, I need a quiet space for some of my children. How many times a day do you sit at your desk? No. Huh? Never. That's what she said. Never. Um, so look, this, I would say that probably a fourth of her classroom was in this space. And it was like, and so how much are you there? Well, after school, I sit down and I active listening, right? And so we said, well, if one of the areas you need, can't we take part of this space and make it into a quiet area for the children? So let's look at what we did. This is built by a papa. It's just a little structure and with a kind of a top on it and rugs in there. So this whole, and this is only a part of that space. So think about your space in a different way. Inside, have soft and the pillows and the mattresses, some soft music to listen to. Okay. And it doesn't have to be big changes. It's sometimes it's just storing things so you know what's there, putting labels on them, organizing them. This was from a teacher who wanted an art area. She had no place in her classroom to do it. She had to use where she used her lunchroom. And so what we did is we made mo movable art center. And so we organized materials together like that. And then it was on a tray. And so you pay, when you finished art, you took it off the tray, you set it back over on the counter, and you had lunch. So it's trying to think about how you can use the spaces in different ways. Okay. Different kind of storage. Clear storage is best because the children can see where things are. This is our book cases. This is an area where there were storage areas. We changed those, okay. This is a center that had seven doors. It used to be a grocery store. And they had gone in and stripped it all out and turned it into an early childhood program, which was a beautiful program. But the problem was there's so many doors. And with little children, what does a door want? Open, right? So all the things you can put on it, you know, it's still a door to open. So we changed that. And we made it a display area. Now you can't open it. So now you can display. They have their... Uh, some of their clay structures that they built. They have some plants there. So they changed that hole so it's not appealing to them to go out now. Okay. Liter literacy at every space. In your block area, what is it you want the children to learn here? You don't just say it. You put it right there for them. You say they can't read it. Well, they know those are words. They begin to get the idea that you're communicating with it. So you fill their world with literacy. This is a great center that this teacher did. It was a drama center where they did put on plays. They wrote their own play. They put them on. And so every child would sign in before they went on the stage. A literacy opportunity. Now look at that and look at the differences in the writing ability of those children. They're all in the same kindergarten classroom. So you've got some of them that are doing really great, pretty close to being, and then you've got some that are just really way out there. But that doesn't matter on this signing sheet. You can write it in your own way. Okay, next. This is a message board, which is great to put in your writing area or in your community area where children can write notes to each other. You remember how we got our hands smacked when we wrote notes? Or worse yet, your teacher read them in front of the classroom. We really, we really want to encourage children to do that because that is a way of communicating. 
This, yeah, this is a, our album for the families that had military parents. Okay. Now this is a before uh, uh, art center. I don't think, folks, I've ever seen a room that had coral bookcases. I'm like, where is the architect's mind when they put coral bookcases in a classroom? And I mean, that picture doesn't even do it justice. I mean, it is bright. Well, first point was, can we paint them? Well, they're not, they're laminated. So it makes it harder for them to paint. Oh, you wouldn't have. Who said they liked it? If, I mean, it's just, when I walked in there, it was like, Phew. Um. Okay, next one. So we went in and changed the art area. Uh, we had a featured artist, which has on here on the left side. Uh, well, that was the area before. And then we put the featured artist on the right. We, be, we couldn't paint the cabinets. So what we did is we turned them into an art gallery. And what we did is we put black behind it. So all of those coral cabinets were covered with pieces of black construction paper. And then the children's artwork was displayed on that. And it became their art gallery. And the displays were beautiful with that back, that black behind them rather than in the front. Okay. Uh, again, using baskets and trays. Trays are really good. And a lot of your schools and uh, centers have these old trays that are cracked and things. They're great for putting everything you need on the tray together. And then you store it and put it away together so it makes it really easy to take care of. And then this is the overall view of it after it was finished. Okay. This is a music center before. I'm not sure where the music was, but... <laughs> Okay. So we went in and hung curtains, again the old cheap old curtains, uh, on the wall there. We put, you can't quite see it, but the, uh, the, the race stage uh, is there. And then all the musical instruments are there. And then we added literacy by having a place where when they wanted to perform, they put their names up on that so you could see that. So adding the literacy to that. Okay. Science Center. This is the area that was going to be made into a science center. She really didn't have a science center in her classroom. Okay. This is a science center afterwards where the um, nature area was, some lab activities, some good stories that will go along with it. A very different look. Okay. A lot of natural materials, old stumps that have been blown down and we use them for seats. Children don't have to just sit in chairs. There's lots of ways of sitting. And you don't have to sit at all. Sometimes you can stand. The one on the left was a teacher's idea, which I thought was great. She brought in an old suitcase. She lined it with plastic and made it her, her uh, dirt center. And so it became a wonderful place for the children to dig up um, skeletons, to uh, have all kinds of little bones and things in there that they could look for, or search for. Okay? <laughs> She's getting real good at this. Yeah. Library. Library area. Okay, we're going to do it real quick. This is a library area. Doesn't that make you want to read? <laughs> okay, go. We added a little camping tent. We put all the library materials inside of it, and the teacher said she had the, when she went in the first thing in the morning, the first place they wanted to go was to the library center, be inside of that. Changing of the environment. A block area. Again, this is where there were cabinets and things. Hold on, ladies. Just stick with me. Come on. Uh, block area. This is their block area. Very few blocks there. Okay. After. Same little bitty area, but organized differently. This is a table we built with a, a, a non-breakable mirror on the top so you can build things on it and see how it 
looks from underneath. Then it also has a storage area underneath. And these were built by parents and, and, uh, and uh, teachers. And adding more literacy to the block center, this is a, an architect's drawing. So again, it gives you the tension of seeing how an, or, an architect would design a house and how you would have the words that go along with it. Again, labeling things better. Small changes. This is a sh the one where we did the entire classroom. So hold on just a minute. Let me go through this. I'll do it real quickly. Okay. This is the classroom. This classroom was the co yellow color of a yellow school bus. I mean, it was yellow. And I said to the teacher who was, I was working with, how long has this room been yellow? And she looks at me and she said, it's always been yellow. She'd been in that room nine years and hadn't really noticed that it was the color of a school bus. So what I'm saying is it's, she was a great teacher. I'm not, it was that you don't see it when you're there all the time. You just keep getting it. Okay, let's move real quickly through this set. Uh, this is a before look. Before. Whoa, wait on this one. This is the, the visual overload of the century. Um, this is the before. Now, we started painting things. So here's some of the painting process. All the, remember, all the furniture was all different colors and everything. Okay. Let's skip that one. Go on. Now we're setting up the different areas in the classroom. We're working on that. This is home living after we finish painting it. Science after we finished working with it. Writing area after we finished blocks. We still are not finished with this one because we're getting ready. We're waiting for a rug to go there on the floor there so they could build on that. Okay. This is the overall view. Now how does it look different? Very different kind of space. Now the children can go into the space. They know where the different areas are. They know what they can choose and they know what can do, they can do. And one of the first steps that the teacher had to do is to first declutter. And because I found that it's really hard for us as teachers to, to throw things away, we had three stacks. One stack that I have to keep. One stack that I can give away to somebody who doesn't have it and needs it in their classroom. And the last one is throw it away. And that was really the only way we could make those kinds of decisions because people just couldn't throw some things away. And I understand that. We get attached to them. Okay, that's, I think that's fine. Now, I hope that this has made you think about different ways that you can go back to your classroom and think about it in a new way. Can you do all of these things tomorrow? No. Do, should you? No. <laughs> you should pick out one small area you want to work on, and you should work on that area. Have I given you food for thought? And when you, when you start working on an area, send me a picture of it, the before, and then when you work with it, and I'll put it on my website and give you credit. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.